Grab your cuppa. It's time for the Inclusivity Podcast. Spilling the tea on disability inclusivity. Hello, you're back to the Inclusivity with Jimmy. And today I am spilling the tea on the inclusivity with PwC. We're joined by two really incredible guests, but before we get in and introduce them, let me just tell you my visual description today. So I need a shave. I've been a little bit lazy this week. My hair is starting to look a little bit over to the side. I am white. My hair is dark. I have dark, I'm going to say a dark short beard, although I'm pretty sure there's probably grey bits and ginger bits on it at the moment. I am also wearing a lovely wool blend blue jumper, and I'm sat on my typical sofa with the lovely pale green wall behind me. So as I said, today we are spilling the tea with two incredible guests from PwC. So let's go over and meet our first guest, Kim. Kim, tell us a little bit about you. Hi, Jamie. Thanks for having us. Um, My name is Kim Whippy and I am PwC's Inclusion and Enablement Services Lead, which is always a little bit of a mouthful to get out in one go. Um, I'm a woman with long brown curly hair wearing a dark blue top and my uh, shine rainbow network lanyard today and I'm sat in a phone booth in PwC's office so I've got a a nice sort of recording booth uh, atmosphere. Brilliant well Kim it's so amazing to have you on the show we will come back to you in a moment let's say hello to another PwC legend Chris. Oh yeah sorry yeah I was just uh, questioning the legend bit there but uh... (laughs) Um, yep, so uh, I obviously work in, in PwC as well. Uh, my role within the firm is uh, a digital accessibility manager. Um, visual description of myself. Um, so I'm quite a short male. Okay, so I have uh, brown spiky hair and I am in my home office and I've got a jumper on. Brilliant. Uh, well, look, honestly, it is really great to have you both on here. Um, for anyone who doesn't know who P- PwC is, Kim, do you want to give us a snapshot of who PwC are? Yeah, sure. So you might have heard of us, you might not. Very understandable. We are one of the big four professional services firms. Um, and professional services, that is essentially working with businesses to help them make decisions. So we do all sorts uh, of B2B work from accountancy to consultancy. We do a lot in the technology space. Um, And when I say we're one of the big four, um, we have have 25,000 or so employees in the UK and we're also a global network of firms. So even more all around the world. Um, But Chris and I, we sit in one of our internal, well, our internal line of service. So we're really there to help the business uh, keep going. People have what they need to do their jobs. Um, Basically, all the HR and and IT and exciting kind of behind the scenes stuff. Well, we think it's exciting. You run the show. That's the stuff that runs the show, isn't it? It's like that they're behind the scenes, but in the middle of it all. Uh, absolutely brilliant and listen for me PwC is a brand that I really do recognize not just because AMS has done work with them and partner with them but just use it, use it everywhere use it in offices in Belfast right across the UK again it's one of the top sorry big four I'm going to say top four that's probably right though too let's be real so I want to talk a little bit about PwC because yet yeah, now we know kind of what you do in the market but let's look at the culture of PwC so Kim do you want to tell us a little bit about culture and what the culture is like at PwC for yourself? Yeah sure um, I mean I think as as far as it goes for as working as an organization um, it's definitely a kind of such a big melting pot right we're so huge there's so many different people that work here a huge part of what my team, the inclusion team, is trying to do is making sure that although there's all these different kinds of people and backgrounds, that everybody feels like PwC is the place where they want to be and where they belong. So we've got this big thing that we're really aligning with in all the work that we do at the moment, which is about being inclusion first. So when we look at our culture, it's less about almost that trap of maybe trying to pigeonhole people according to who they are and more looking at actually how do all of us approach the mindset around how we think about inclusion and in a practical sense that's really about what skills do you need like to be a good listener to make sure that you're supporting your colleagues how do you demonstrate that in your leadership so that no matter where you are in in the firm 
it's the right place for you. So, I mean, make it sound kind of nice and easy and straightforward. Obviously, there's lots of complexities around that, but that's really what we're trying to strive for. It's all about inclusion first. I love that you said inclusion first, and I really love belonging as well, because belonging to me has always been in the past a buzzword we hear talking at organisations. But, you know, when I look at PwC or I look at the the accessibility, the inclusion, the work that you do doing there online or just you know, from hearing from clients, you know, it's incredible. You really are putting belonging and inclusion first at the heart of everything, which, as we know, in DNI talk is sometimes cheap, but you're walking the walk, which is so rare and it's just incredible. Chris, I want to talk to you a little bit about the culture of PwC. Tell us then, from your perspective, a little bit about the culture of PwC. Yeah, sure. I, th- I think for me, it's um, I've been in the firm now for coming up to what eight and a half to nine years. Um, and I would say over those nine years, we've seen a huge difference and a huge change in how we support staff within the firm. Um, so I think probably going back to, to things like obviously being able to flexibly work wherever you need to on the day, um, but also things like um, you know, being able to dress for your day. So, you know, we're not expected to come into the office now um, all fu- fully suited or booted if it doesn't fit with what you need to do that day. So. You know, I think for us, uh, there's a lot of different opportunities. And personally, myself, um, I found that, um, you know, from an inclusion point of view, we're talking about it more than we ever have, which is fantastic. So coming into the firm and, uh, you know, seeing people openly talking about you know, feeling included in the workplaces, you know, for me, it's really useful and really powerful. Um, so, yeah, I, Kim, I don't know if there's anything else that I may have missed I think I think hopefully between us we've got it, Chris. But I really liked what you had to say about um, how we're talking about it more and more. And I think I mean I've only been with PwC two and a half years. I'll be having my three year anniversary this January. So uh, and even in the short space of time I've been here, just seeing the amount of space that we're able to give to it is fantastic. Because I know it's not like that everywhere, and we really are given the opportunity to talk about why it matters and and help other people understand that too. Absolutely. And I think it goes back to what you've said as, as well, Jamie, in terms of that collaboration piece. Um, we're working probably uh, across the firm better than we've ever done, um, you know, collaboratively and kind of understanding what people need within the firm and then putting that into place and, you know, practicing and, and listening back to feedback. So I think for us, um, yeah, I think we've still got a long way to go, but I think what we've got at the moment is, you know, really good foundations to get started on. And by the sounds of it, like, you know, that momentum has been growing. As you said, Chris, you've been there nine years, was it? And you've been there nearly three years, Kim. You know, when you think about that there, that's almost like, it's, it's such a long time for me when I think about employment, because for myself, I struggled with employment most of my life. I think this is my longest job. I've been with AMS nearly three years. But when I think about that time, even a year seems like a long time to be in employment. And some people say, oh, well, no, don't employ somebody who's that experience. But when you think about that time scale, to see that difference, to see that momentum building, it must give a real sense of pride in the organisation, um, which I think is very evidential. And when you're talking there about PwC, you can hear, you know, the passion and the excitement for it. And I just think that's incredible. So I want to talk about something about what PwC is doing, which is also equally incredible, which is, and I'm going to I'm hopefully not going to butcher this. So Kim, you've got to keep me right. But you are working on a program for or a campaign that is going to be launching in the next couple of months, I believe. Kim, do you want to talk to me about that? Yeah, I'd love to. Um, so you're right, exactly right. It's a campaign. Um, we're calling <laughs> we're calling it enabling everyone, and it's rooted in the idea of promoting greater acceptance and understanding of disability, but not just saying, okay, disability exists fine done but actually what disabled people and neurodivergent people can achieve and do achieve like every single day the successes um showing that it's possible um to thrive at pwc whilst being disabled so we and it really all came about because uh we we spoke to our colleagues we actually did a whole piece of work and and listening groups and surveys to understand where as chris said we you know there are bits where there's still a lot of work to do we know we do not get it right across the board 100 percent of the time so we wanted to understand what people wanted to see and and what more we could do and it really came out very strongly that there just isn't enough awareness so we thought okay well let's make a consistent effort not just to talk about it in December with International Day of Persons with Disabilities but to have a campaign that's sustained 
and that keeps bringing this to the fore and keeps saying oh, disability is really important and we need to continually be talking about it. So yeah, campaign, we're launching hopefully November. Uh, really excited to kind of share more on that over the next few months. I think that is honestly going to be incredible. I really like the fact that you said you took feedback from your colleagues because that's something that I personally feel is such an untapped resource in business is you have colleagues there with lived experience of disability, of neurodiversity or neurodivergence, whatever you want to term it there. But we have those colleagues with lived experience and often businesses forget to consult with those people or ask them, you know, what can we do right? Because they're the people who's going to know, they're in the front, their front lines. Um, so Chris, in terms with your, your involvement, have you been involved with the project or you know, what are you excited most about the project? Uh, so, yeah, so it's so another good question. I think, I think for me, um, I have had some involvement in some of the technologies behind the, the campaign. So um, some of the areas that, um, that we wanted to make sure we got right and we covered were obviously things like the use of closed captions all the way through the video. Uh, and Kim, keep me correct. We're also looking at audio descriptions as well throughout the video. So just make sure that obviously, you know, for us, make sure people are seeing that, you know, I think it's really important that if you've got comms coming out about, you know, inclusion, they need to be inclusive anyway. So, you know, for us, it's, um, it's going to help sort of raise that exposure within our firm, especially around, you know, use of different technologies. We've also looked at, you know, working with uh, some of our vendors to make sure that the platforms that we're going to be hosting the video on is accessible as well. So, you know, somebody can go through, and have a thing, you know, something like a transcription if they needed it, or you know, extra time or different speeds to playback. So I think for us, it's it's been really important to to kind of understand that. Um, but I think going back to what Kim said as well, um, this hasn't just been created by by Kim's team. It's been, you know, created across the board with other people across PwC. And whilst we've been doing that, it's also raised, you know, the exposure, but also a little bit of an opportunity to upskill as well which i think has really helped with uh, with the campaign i think that sounds incredible i think that one of the things with organizations is you know inclusion impacts every part of your organization so the more if your business that's the word the more involved each part of the business is and by the sounds of it it's involved so many different parts of your business here um now correct me if i'm wrong but i'm right to say when we were talking about this before we recorded that you have People, colleagues with actual lived experience featuring this, actors playing the p- people who have the disability or neurodivergence. So it's almost that like they're not acting these roles, it's almost they're living out their lived experience. Am I right? Yeah, absolutely. So the, the sort of theme, call to action, or, or however you like, of this launch video that we're going with is um, it's called You're Welcome. And it's all about celebrating and recognizing the contributions that disabled and neurodivergent people have made. So actually, we think sometimes people can fall into the trap of thinking accessibility, that's got nothing to do with me. But actually, as well as benefiting very many disabled people, we all use things every single day that were originally invented for disabled people to meet access needs. So that's what it's highlighting. But in developing the script and coming up with the scenarios, we went to our disability network right from the beginning and asked for a few volunteers that we could bounce that off of to check that it was authentic and also to ask for volunteers who'd like to star in it and actually portray the scenario that was relevant to their experience. So the way the whole thing was developed was we actually ended up cutting and chopping and changing stuff so that, so that it was real for the people involved. Um, Just to give you a really quick example, we have a a scenario uh, with a deaf colleague and we originally did want to incorporate some signing into that, but the colleague isn't a signer, he uses captions, so we said, okay, you know, it wouldn't be right for you to sort of feel that you had to go and learn some sign language when that's not how you kind of live your life, we'll just kind of alter the script a bit for that. And he gave some really good feedback on the language we were using as well, so it's, yeah, it's been really collaborative, which has been great. And I think from that, when you were talking about your colleague there, one of the things I got from that is, you know, when, you, when, people, when people talk to me about being visually impaired, or I tell somebody I'm registered blind, they automatically think I have a cane or I have a guide dog. Now, I do not have a cane, and I do not have a guide dog because I have two dogs who are absolutely the opposite of guide dogs. They trip me up constantly because they're tiny. Um, but, you know, it's it's getting that real lived experience because it's not always where you think it is. Every blind person doesn't need this. Every deaf person isn't going to know how to look sign everyone is unique to their own lived experience and i love this um view and accessibility that it benefits everybody 
because it really does. You know, if we look at things like bendy straws, bendy straws, although they weren't specifically created for people with disability, it was a man had created it for his daughter because he knew she was struggling to drink a drink. So he created a straw and the first bendy straw. Hospitals bought that idea and started using it for patients who were in hospital with short term or long term disability who, who couldn't get up and you know, had the use of their arms to actually hold a glass. So for me, you know, it's things like that where accessibility is so rooted throughout our society, we sometimes don't even know it. You know, electric toothbrush, that was created for people with disabilities, benefits everybody. I want to move on because we will come back to this at some point because, again, I am so excited to launch this here. And, you know, for everyone involved at PwC, massive congratulations because it's stuff that, like this that is the new way forward. We've talked about the challenges. We've talked about the struggles. It's time to actually let people see that lived experience through the lens of somebody living the experience. So absolutely well done there. Um, I want to come to you, Chris, so I do. I want to talk to you about some of the challenges because with, with your role in PwC, you work with very much within that accessibility space, technology space, which you know, some people will have no clue about. Some people like myself are so curious. So I want to ask you, what is one of the biggest challenges you find working within the inclusivity space around accessibility? So the, there are a few. So, I mean, you know, for, for us, it's quite difficult to, to kind of pinpoint it down to, mm. to, to kind of one. Um, I think for us, it's, you know, it's more a case of a lot of people don't really consider assistive tech or, you know, adaptive um, toolkits or anything similar to that um, until they really need one. So I think it's quite difficult to to actually reach out to people that, that perhaps you know, may need something in the future. So that's one area that we have is, is getting people interested, you know, making sure that you know, they're really using the tools so that if they do need them in the future, they're almost pre-inside ready to go with them. Um, so I think, I think that's, that's a barrier. Um, and I think probably for us, is, it's really difficult to stay on top of what the latest accessibility features are because especially over the last 18, 18 months, I would say, 18, two years, perhaps, um, we've just seen this explosion and, you know, new assistive technologies coming forwards and, you know, having things that perhaps we didn't have access to before that are now built into your laptops and your iPhones you know, and, your, and your devices. Um, so I think for us, it's trying to stay ahead of that and just understand what's coming down, down the pipeline. So, you know, that we're ready to help support others as well. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's been some other barriers. So um, AI has been one of them. Um, so AI is fantastic for doing things and helping you, you know, what you're going to do. So perhaps we've got, you know, Alexa in the background. Um, but actually, if we rely on it too much, that actually it, it strips away that thought process of continuing to, to make something accessible. So actually you rely too much on AI that then makes mistakes. So I think for us, it's trying to, trying to keep people true and trying to still keep, you know, that learning process in place and not relying too much on it's, you know, going to be useful. Um, and I know, um, Kim, we also talked about some of the exciting stuff that we do at PwC. And one of them is, you know, we're really spending a lot of time and effort on things like metaverse, mm -hmm. um, you know, these new technologies that are coming down, which perhaps, you know, they're coming in very, very quickly and, you know, to stay on top of, you know, inclusion, making sure that everybody has access to that is quite challenging as well. Mm. Um, so, yes, a few, a few of the examples there. That sounds honestly absolutely like you're very busy. But one of the things, and I want to talk about this little story because one of the first um, times I ever came across yourself, Chris, was you were doing a talk, and it was with I think it was with Tax Help, and I was kind of had passed to swung in, so I had to even know where I was there. But you were talking about the work that you had done at Tax Help and making sure that you were rolling that out across the business, so you know that. It's not a kind of ad hoc request when somebody says, comes and says, I need a piece of assistive technology, but you almost have them there in the background, different tools and things that people can utilize or to download themselves without having to always request. And it was something that completely changed my way of thinking about adjustments because from my lived experience perspective of accessibility, I've always had to ask for adjustments. And, you know, as you said, it, the advancements in technology over the years has really sped up the, that space. But when you don't know that yourself, it's so hard to kind of know what's right for you. I'm 32. I've tried so many screen readers in my life, and I've only now found one that actually is comfortable for me. And in fact, it's only a screen reader, it's Dragon Software, but it doesn't do any Zoom text or anything from magnification for my screen. So it's probably not the most beneficial because I need more tools on top, but trying to go through that journey of finding that out. And 
I think to have a team dedicated to kind of helping answer those questions is it's just absolutely incredible. Um, so Kim, I want to come back to you. So we do. Can you talk me through? So uh, PwC, you offer hybrid working, isn't that right? Yeah, so we have as part of our, um, we call it the deal, which is essentially our employee value proposition. Um, we have something called empowered flexibility, which is our sort of, in a nutshell, term for work, what in terms of kind of the role that you're doing and what you're doing day to day, work in a way that suits you. So the when, the where and the how of how you do your work, um, provided that you're able to get your job done and do what you need to do. And obviously we make adjustments within that as a consideration. Um, it is generally pretty flexible. Um, and obviously kind of hybrid working and, and blended working, and there's lots of different terms out there has absolutely exploded. It was already something that we were looking at before before 2019 and before coronavirus, but um, that's really accelerated it a lot and has thrown up some new and interesting challenges because it's, although we've always worked flexibly, it's just permanently shifted the boundaries of that, I think. And although people may have done kind of that home office split a bit more, we are seeing more people finding that the home environment works for them or that the office environment works for them and kind of just a lot more um, variety in how people are working. And I think to sort of take that to the accessibility point, we've got a fab team in our health, safety and environment team who were very well set up when coronavirus happened because of the tech that we have. And, you know, we all have our laptops and phones. We're very lucky. They could do the shift to home working and they could support people and provide that remote support where people needed things in that home environment to keep them going. Um, now that we're shifting back into this hybrid space, I think it's fair to say it is throwing up additional challenges about how we sustain that. Um, and about how we keep accessibility and inclusion front of mind, because the reasons that people have for working from home or working from an office aren't always just about what needs to get done that day, but about their access needs. And they, those can fluctuate day to day. So um, really, I guess, in a nutshell, it, it's something that we're still grappling with, um, that we're still talking about. Um, uh, but I think it's probably fair to say it's the case for most organizations and we are lucky that we've got the sort of teams focusing on it and the tech available but certainly haven't cracked it yet well i mean you should definitely make it straight uh, leaps and bounds and that's based because you know i have, I have friends who's worked at pwc when you see used to, um online you used to talk about that model of um hybrid working or being in the office wherever it is that you actually have to work from or remote working it's leading the way and i think when you have twenty five thousand people I think the, the work's a lot much more harder because there's so many more people to delegate. But I think as well, you know, with COVID, I think we've seen an increase of people being able to work from home, recognising for the first time that this is actually an option, whereas before it was never feasible. Uh, people would kind of tiptoe around the situation or put it through as a workplace accommodation. So, Kim, to your point there, I want to ask a follow-up question around, do you, um, for yourself, you know, what would be the biggest challenge uh, for anybody trying to look at the model of working remotely or what would you say is the biggest benefit either the challenge or benefit or both whatever you prefer okay um I mean I might try and do a little bit of both because I think it's connected for me um and I think it's around communication uh because when you're remote let's start perhaps with the challenge and then I can finish on a high with a benefit when you're not working in the same location you need to make sure say if you're a manager or you're kind of in that role where you need you're looking out for others in your team that communication lines are really there that that it's active because you're not going to just be able to call over to someone um, who's sitting next to you in the office you actually really have to invest that time in making sure that you're staying in touch and you understand how things are going and that that's all working but then I think to flip that that can be a, a huge benefit because of the flexibility it allows uh, before I personally like to sort of use myself as an example. Before I came to PwC, a lot of my meetings were all face to face or over the phone. But at PwC, we heavily use video calls. And so when we all started remote working remotely a lot more, we use video calls. And actually, I discovered that's a fantastic way for me to communicate because I understand better what people are saying when I can see their faces, um, more so than over a phone call. And I'd actually never worked remotely, if you could believe that, <laughs> before I came to PwC. I was five days in the office um, all week. And I found that actually it's really good just to have a bit of quiet and a bit of space when you need to focus. So I think there's some huge benefits to just having that flexibility uh, provided, provided the communication is there. 
And what about yourself, Chris? So probably the same question. You know, what would you think would be the biggest challenge or biggest benefit? Um, and if it's the same, feel free to see that answer as well. So yeah, for, from my side, I've I've worked from home from pretty much day one when I joined home. So the last eight years, um, obviously, you know, in the office, but also home as well. So I've always had that option to, to kind of work from home. Um, one of the things that I found is back then, the technology was really bad, really, really bad. So you'd have to, for example, you'd have to pull your landline with you because obviously, you know, you didn't have a mobile. Um, it would be really difficult to connect into calls. You'd have to organize things. Um, actually, it was really difficult, really tricky to kind of get things like meetings into the calendars because you didn't have that shared calendar. So I think for us, um, especially over the last few years, we've seen, you know, being able to collaborate easily. So being able to jump onto a video call really quickly. Um, PwC did away with all landlines a couple of few years back. So we now have no no physical landlines in the building. So everybody got a mobile phone um, that follows them. So effectively that made things a bit easier. Um, you had apps that you can get to and all the, all the stuff there. Um, so I think for us, it's um, I think we've really done well to overcome that barrier. And I think that's really helped in terms of how inclusive we are as a firm. Um, and I think probably the downside of that is that um, it can be really tricky and echoing what Kim said around perhaps people coming into the firm that have never worked in the firm before and actually really struggling to settle in. Perhaps they need an adjustment or, you know, for them, it could be quite tricky to kind of say, well, I need some help at home or, you know, I haven't got my manager that's sat on the same table as me now it's quite difficult to tell them I need closed captioning, for example, or perhaps I need an adaption to my working hours. And, you know, I think working from home, it's, it can be quite challenging. Um, so I think that's probably for me is just getting back into the office and actually seeing people face to face can, can really help with people's confidence as well. I really can. You know, I, when you were talking there, I was reminded that there's times I think when we work from home and we do come against something at work in the work that maybe isn't as accessible or it's maybe not as inclusive or you know, maybe somebody's doing something you're not able to follow. You know, my site, I barely can see what's going on my screen half the time. Um, so trying to keep up with people, it is a challenge. And you know, I've, I've recognised that from what you've said that it's so much easier to step back when you're working remotely and say, actually, I'm not going to say nothing because there's no point. It's just a one or do that kind of way when really if you were in person, it would be quite evidential that I wasn't happy because I'm quite vocal with my, well, not even with my voice, but with my facial expressions. It's very clear when I'm unhappy with something. Um, I really love um, that what we've kind of talked about here is coming back to technology because for me, it really has set us leaps and bounds ahead of where we need to go for inclusion accessibility. So Chris, in terms of um, accessibility then and technology, where do you see um, this accessibility going in the future you know, in your opinion where do you see that going in the space you're working in you, that's one of my favorite questions um, okay so uh, where would i like to see it go um i know we focus focus quite heavily on on vr and obviously you know metaverse and that's fantastic and we should really carry on doing that but i think for me where i'd like to see more time um, and more focus on is around augmented reality so being able to stay within the real world but have almost that additional layer over the top. So, you know, it's things like um, if you suffer with dyslexia, having, you know, the ability to, to have some help visually whilst you're looking at somebody or perhaps um, myself, I really, really struggle with remembering names, um, for example, or remembering places that I've been um, and actually being able to have that right up front, right on, you know, if I perhaps had some glasses on or something similar where it could come up next to the person you know, be fantastic. Again, you've got things like closed captioning. I know that's that's one area that, you know, we've seen really sort of leaping forwards. Um, but I think for me, it's just, I'd really like to see it um, at a point where everybody gets accessibility, um, sort of upskilling, even at a school level. I think that's for me, I'd, I'd like to see um, more going in early on um, in sort of lower primary school and early years where they get some some really good education around accessibility and what it is um i've already seen from my son um that he's coming home now and asking questions that i never would have asked at his age so i mean there's definitely some work being done um but i do think there's there's more room that can you know, more things that need to happen i think 
And I think for myself, like, for me and my sponsor, because our podcast is sponsored by Diverse Educators, I think that them hearing what you said about school is so relevant to what they're trying to do as well as that accessibility, especially in content. You know, we, we teach young people about online safety, but we don't teach them the kind of fundamentals of how to add alt text to an image. What's the difference in alt text, image description? How do you add captions? You know, these little fixes are things that I think if we had that ingrained from a, a much younger age, we'd be more forward than we are currently at the moment. I think for myself, that's the biggest gap. Um, but Kim, coming across to yourself then, um, from the kind of inclusion lens, um, meets accessibility, where would you like to see um, accessibility go to the next level? Where is that next level for you? I think for me, and, and we're starting to see this, I think it's really about um, the normalization and the personalization. So for the normalization, it's about making it every day accessible in itself so that you're not you know, it's a new concept for some people. And like, there's that learning piece where people have to suddenly get to grips with what these words mean and, and what that looks like in practice. And I think making it feel a lot more every day um, will go, and we're starting to see that definitely in all the work that Chris is doing and kind of bringing those experiences in. I think it would really help. And in terms of the personalization, I think that's what sort of tapping into our inclusion work we're really trying to achieve in the recognizing the everybody comes with their own sort of set of needs and there isn't like a nice easy list of if you are x you need y um and actually being a lot more adaptable um and again with the work that to kind of to shout out chris again that you're doing around the assistive technology so that we do have a range of things available and we look at what functionality people best need rather than sort of matching okay you know you've got a condition and this is the solution for that it's about actually you know what do you need to do and, and what are the barriers preventing you from doing that so how can we enable you um and i think just kind of because we were talking about um sort of adjustments and it's not always easy to ask for those i think one of the biggest sort of hurdles we're trying to get around at the moment is the like the quote unquote soft adjustments and the stuff that's a bit less tangible and is a bit more about flexibility um, because there isn't it's so specific to what people need it isn't always easy to say okay here's the solution I can recommend to you it needs to be a conversation and adjustments are only as good and as effective um, if you can ask for them and if the environment is right in the first place for you to be able to have that conversation. So yeah, normalization, individualization. I love that. I, I think that needs to be on mugs and logos. Like that was a really great response because it is, it is about I think what you should do with your campaign that's coming up around accessibility, I think that kind of ties in with that really well because it's about for me, it, it is about that customization, making it personable. Um, and having real people, I think, share their stories, share how it benefits them. But then educating people to the fact that you actually benefit from this too, but you don't even know it. You know, if you're in the, on the way to work in the morning, you forgot your headphones at home, you're looking to watch, I don't know what it is, the latest RuPaul episode, you can tell what I try to watch when I'm out and about, um, and you don't have your headphones. Nobody wants to be listening to a video full, uh, full speaker on the train or the bus. So you, the first thing you can do is turn on your captions. You know, those little things, those little remedies, people aren't aware of fast accessibility. And I think the more that we can do to educate in that space is incredible and make it personable, make it customised, as you said. I uh, absolutely love that. So for our listeners who maybe are listening are now going, I want to work at PwC. I want to come work with Chris and Kim. What would be your, where would you signpost them to? So where's the best place for one of our listeners to go look for the um, PwC? Oh, gosh. I mean, if you really are interested in finding out more about us, fantastic. Go to pwc.co.uk forward slash careers. And I say that's not just where you find our jobs. It's where you find what we try and put across about our ethos. We've got all the information about inclusion on there. We talk about um, the adjustments we offer. Uh, we talk about the, the broad range of work that we're doing. Um, so I'm just here with my inclusion hat on and, and my knowledge about disability. But there's heaps that we're doing in um like the social mobility space in the community space that people really love to get involved with when they work with us so um yeah i definitely think uh, checking out our website would be the first port of call 100 and like i think for me one of the things i tell anybody with lived experience or disability or in your divergence is if you're going to go find an employer you need to research that employer like it's nobody else's business. You need to be able to look at their website. You need to be able to see if they're accessible, if they're inclusive, if they talk about disability, if they talk about neurodiversity, if they talk about DNA. Because for me, 
that's how we know who's talking to talk and who's walking to walk. It's who is making real tangible steps, who is holding themselves accountable, who is opening themselves up. And like, you know, when we talk about um disability inclusion and we are talking about it openly, we open ourselves up to scrutiny. And I think that's one of the best, worst things, because it will never please everybody. But I think it's really good because when you're showing the people like myself what you're doing, the steps that you're taking to improve, I think that is worth its weight in gold because not every business does it. They will say they're inclusive when they're really not. Um, another one I'm going to plug for you is, is your LinkedIn and your social media pages because that is pretty much where I sit and gasp and all and be like, I love my job at AMS. If I didn't work at AMS, I would work at PwC because the offices in Belfast are also stunning. Um, so just before we kind of come into our last few minutes to wrap up and have a little bit of spill the tea moment, I want to ask you is, what has been your favourite moment working at PwC to date? Oh, shall I go first on that one? Because there is one that, that really, really thicks up with me. So um, I think for me, it's, uh, and it goes back to the assistive technology piece. I mean, um, I came into it kind of accidentally. I, I happened to bump into one of our IT directors that was kind of running down the middle of the office, trying to find somebody to help with a screen reader. And I, at the time, had no idea what I was doing. And I just said, look, I'll have a look, see if I could go and fix it, see if I could get it working. Um, got it working, I got it fixed. And then it kind of sparked that little bit of, uh, everybody gets it, um, What's what else is there? And I think for me, it just uh, it kind of cascaded into hours and days of me sitting there doing research and trying new assistive technologies and trying to understand it. Um, and one of the things I think probably for me is um, I, got to a point where actually it wasn't just um, almost a side hustle at work it, it was becoming my full-time role um, and for me it was just having um, our leadership teams um, actually support me and say yes we really think that there's you know scope and you know reason for you to become an assistive technology manager so you know that was um, for me kind of a really good position in my life because it actually meant that I was doing something I really enjoyed doing. Um, it's led on to a few things. So I've, I've done, um, I know, um, Kim, I don't I need to set one up for you, but we we obviously run internally what's called the assistive technology escape rooms as well. So I was given enough um, scope and enough sort of reach to go and develop and, and sort of run those, um, which if anybody hasn't done one yet, um, inside of PwC, come and find me. Um, <laughs> uh, but we're also looking at perhaps running a few externally and what it basically is it's an escape room um, you're not actually physically locked in the room so don't don't panic um, okay we had to get that one past health and safety internally which is an interesting conversation <laughs> no but basically it's um you, it's, you have a scenario where you're locked in a room uh, with 10 other people and you're effectively using assistive technology to solve clues um, and escape the room so you kind of it's half an hour experience and what it actually does is it gives me me half an hour um, with people that are locked in the room to actually just tell them about assistive technology and answer their questions so that's probably been one one of my favorite times here at the firm um, and getting to work with people like Kim Whippy. That's incredible so it is Chris I'm just thinking about that as, um, escape room uh, that is an innovation. Like that's the word I come to my mind. It's in, how innovating of an idea. That's incredible. Um, if you do open that up, please take me along because I will probably have so many questions about different pieces of assistive technology. Certainly, no screen readers and magnification. Um, Kev, what has been your favourite moment or standout moment for you? Oh, I love it. Um, I mean, we were all set up to do an escape room and then lockdown happened. So I'll definitely be back back on that, um, Chris. Um, my favourite moment. Um, so it's a little bit cheeky because it's a moment that technically lasted six months, but it would be doing the research project that has led, it into, led us into the campaign we've developed and our strategic focus on disability because that was a good chunk of time where I actually really managed to sink my teeth into developing a survey and kind of focus groups that would give us the insight that we needed, connecting really closely with our colleagues and hearing their experiences, some of which were just absolutely so powerful. I know it's kind of easy to say that word, but some of them like really made you feel like what they had been through, both good and bad. And we could then 
literally take those quotes that people have so generously shared with us and take that to leadership and say, this is why this matters, because this is what people are feeling working here. Um, and here is what we can do about it. So to get that buy in, to get that tangible, um, I guess, evidence of what needed to happen to be able to actually take that forward. Um, I'm really pleased with, with what we managed to do around that. And again, it kind of working with Chris and our other colleagues internally to make sure that areas that they look at, like um, accessibility or like our adjustments process, that we were getting the right info on that so that it's something that we all sort of take forward together. Um, I don't think any of this stuff, especially around accessibility, can really be driven in isolation. It's got to be all of you across the organisation uh, all looking at it. And you know that is something like I I I'm honestly so inspired. Like if I didn't have my job at AMS, I would be banging your doors tomorrow saying refer me in now, um because it, it it's so true. Everything you said. Every, I think what PwC is doing for me is they're leading the way by innovating, by empowering their people, and you know even just taking that data, that feedback, that real empowerment, that per- powerful feedback that you've talked about, it's. It's such, it's, it's not like, I'm not saying it's an easy thing to do because I can't imagine how to cal- cal- calculate data from 25,000 employees. All credit to you. I still use a calculator to go past 10. Uh, all credit to the teams. But for me, you know, when I think about that, businesses miss that every time. They have a resource within that business and that is the people with the lived experience. Ask them questions, get them involved because as you said, there's power in it. Um, so listen, it's been incredible having you both. We're going to do our goodbyes in a moment, but before we do that, I want to do a moment that is now becoming a bit of a tradition on this podcast, which is spill the tea moment. So spill the tea is essentially a moment that you have maybe encountered inaccessibility or an uninclusive moment and that you've been able to champion it either for yourself or for an individual. Don't go into too much specifics if you don't want to, but we'll start with Kim. Let's go with you. Tell us your spill the tea moment. Oh, gosh. OK, so this is going to be very off the cuff because I haven't prepared it in advance. Um, but I think um, I think I'm going to say um, something we've not touched on yet, which is a bit around um, our professional qualifications. So just for context, working at PwC, if you're training to be an accountant, you go through professional qualifications and by no means can I claim all credit, but I like to think I've helped championing some of the support around that through being a person that people can come to to share what they've been finding challenging and then to then escalate concerns back to teams internally or to the organisations that we work with. So to try and um, help them change their policies. That's incredible. And again, getting that real feedback, like I think people-led organisation. Like, I'm going to be sitting here writing buzzwords all day by PwC and inspired about you. Um, Chris, what about you? What's your tea moment? Oh, uh, uh, so I would say, I would say over the last few years, we've seen um, more, a lot more notifications. So a lot more information coming forwards, uh, emails on demand and kind of, you know, chat messages and all sorts of stuff like that. So I think for me, it's been about helping people to reduce that a little bit. Um, so champion and, you know, the fact that if you're out of the office, you're out of the office, you know, and you don't need to continually picking up your emails. And, you know, if it's OK to to perhaps step away and, and spend some time for yourself and look after your health as well. So I think for me, it's just looking at that and just how we how we look after people with, you know, what's called obviously information overload, isn't it? Or that that fear of missing out. and just making sure that people are not burning themselves out as well. So obviously when we're talking about um, assistive technology users as well, that's a whole new level. So you've got somebody perhaps that is okay to, you know, keeping up with notifications down to somebody perhaps that's um, dyslexic or using a screen reader. And then all of a sudden they've got so much information coming towards them. Um, it can just be really overwhelming. So I think for us, it's trying to reduce that, trying to look at um, going back to basics um and you're not missing out if you're away it's just you know we need to come back and get back to that i think i love that and i'm going to quote rupaul again and i know you're going to tell i'm rupaul madness but if you can't love yourself how the hell are you going to love somebody else and rupaul says that to his queens and it's about taking that time for yourself because it's so important in this space of working on accessibility of inclusion even being somebody with lived experience or facing barriers it's so easy to feel that burnout 
and to try to just push through it when really what you need to do is just take yourself off for a few days go have that lovely hot bath go have that weekend away in the caravan or wherever you're going but it's so important to take that time so chris kim I'll be sharing your details on our website and I am so excited to link in with this project as we're running. But thank you so much for spilling the tea today on the inclusivity. For anybody who has any questions, please do check out our website where you'll have links to their LinkedIn profiles. Um, but from me, if you are looking to get in touch about the show or have any questions that you want me to direct to Kim or Chris, please reach out to jamie.shields at theinclusivity.com or visit our website www.theinclusivity.com Remember, drop the ty hyphen t dot com. Until next time, stay good. Bye, everybody.